So it's like 12.02 Eastern time. Don't know what time it is at your place, but it's like around lunchtime here. Um, we do have some new people. So I don't know if people want to go around and introduce themselves. Um, how would you guys like to work today? It is up to everybody else. Okay, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves. How about that? Or Kendall, were you going to say something else? Yeah, I was going to go first. Um, so I'm Kendall Arthur. Uh, my pronouns are he and his. Um, I'm the director of residence life here at McNeese State University in Southwest Louisiana. Um, I'm not new to the group. I think I've been to a, meet, a few meetings here and there, but but it's been a while since I've been to a, a, a meeting. So I'm happy to be here. Well, welcome back. Yes, I've seen your name on a couple too. So welcome back. Okay, Debbie, you get to start it off and everybody's going to say who they are and where they're from. Oh, wait, I'm Beth Ackman. I'm the director of housing at SUNY Morrisville um, in Central New York. And my pronouns are she and hers and the uh, smoke has left the Central New York region. In case anybody was wondering when Canada caught on fire. Moving on. I can go. Beth, it's really hard to hear you too. I don't know if it's just me or if other people are having a hard time hearing you. So I'm Debbie Kolstad and I am a director of residence life at Lewis Clark State College. Did that help Debbie? I just fixed it. Does that help or no? Okay, I switched microphones on my computer. Sorry about that. Douglas, would you like to go? Yeah, it was much better, Beth. Uh, I'm Doug Adams. I'm the Associate Dean of Students at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The smoke has come to Pennsylvania, so we uh, currently have a lovely 450 AQI, um, so we're locked up inside. Um, and uh, This is actually my first time with this group for, I think, in a long, long time, so uh, good to be back. Doug, I was just down in your area. Um, my name is Amy Kotner. I'm from Cuca College. Um, in New York, I'm the EVP for Student Life, um, Dean of Students, Title IX Coordinator, and uh, I support our Director of uh, Residence Life. So I was from New York. Luckily, I was on vacation because we had that. And then I was down in your area yesterday, and I returned to Central Pennsylvania, where I also have a home, and we were at 450 yesterday. We're now down to 160. So yeah, so I, I woke up, just to warn you, woke up. Felt like I had been crying all night. So good luck to you all. Hi, everybody. I'm Maureen Islib. Um, I'm the Director of Residential Life at Wesleyan University, located in Middletown, Connecticut, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Hi, everyone. My name's Tori. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina at William Peace University, and I'm the Area Coordinator for First Year Communities. Beth or Linda, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sorry, it's a little loud here. I'm Beth Eaton. I am the Assistant Director of Assignments, Data, and Logistics at Setson University. And I didn't hear what the last one was. Pronouns. Oh, she or hers. Can anybody hear Linda? I can't. Okay, Linda, no one can hear you. Sorry. Yep, that might help. <laughs> I dial I volume on my phone. So uh, I join you guys every once in a while just so I can hear you talk, so I can glean some more information. I am Linda Schoonmaker. I'm the vice president of finance and administration at Big Bang Community College in Moses Lake, Washington, and I have. Uh, housing reports directly to me, and I spend a lot of time over there. And every time we don't have a director, I camp out over there. So I love getting information from other people. So it's great. Thank you. And I'm she, her, hers. Awesome. I do. Oh, sorry. I don't know if anybody has some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Do we want to go through those really quick and see where we're at? And everybody can hear me, right? Awesome. Okay. Oh, hi, Luis. Do you want to introduce yourself and your preferred pronouns? Hey, all. 
Uh, my name is Louis. Luis Jimenez is Inoa, so Louis or Luis is fine. I'm the Associate Dean of the College for Student Living and Wellness at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. There's some construction going on outside of me, so every now and then you may hear some additional additional <laughs> noises here. So welcome all. Uh, Luis is also the co-chair for Student Living and Universities, so he's my partner in crime. So there y'all can know that part too. Um, okay, so we have a few questions. Some are very similar and some are a little different. Um, so the first one is, how are you promoting your summer housing to camps, organizations, and non-affiliations to utilize rent during the summer? At Kiyuka, we actually have a client and conference specialist, so they oversee all the marketing and, and uh, information. So right now, because of all the staffing changes and, and everything, it's been mainly um, our repeat people that we've had over the years um, and that, but we are definitely trying to get out and do more and, and look at avenues and, uh, you know, ensuring too, with having minors on campus, we're following our minors policy, et cetera, um, that we created last year because we did not have one until I came last year. So, um, and trying to get everyone to understand all of that. We have our auxiliary takes care of all of it. They do the marketing, they do the housing placement in the summer, and they work with our CFO for cash, like transfer of whatever percentages, stuff like that. We don't really do much with it. Um, is there anybody else that does much with the college camps, other things, other organizations, marketing? Yeah, um, we had, you know, a, a history of that. I, I, I certainly say that um, COVID diminished kind of the the use of the campus in that that way. Vassar is a it's an old campus. Much many of our houses, um, dormitories, dorms here don't have um, air conditioning, so a lot of camps don't like to use our space because they're just too hot um, here. So the majority of the spaces that um, are used are just for kind of internal uh, programs. There is one um, powerhouse theater, uh, a New York based company that comes up to utilize some of our spaces for um, their actors. But um, aside from that, you know, we had like a gifted and talented program that used to come here and that no longer happens. Um, we do have some sport camps. Um, and by and large, that is a, thankfully a, a different department that kind of handles that. We just handle any internal students that are staying here for summer. We don't have summer classes, but we do have a lot of students staying here for research um, and for summer employment. Um, I, I, I will say, I think one of the things that I, even though I think we're losing in some ways some re revenue there, um, what it has allowed us to do is to just do more um, maintenance work in the houses. Uh, because of the spaces are are not being used year round, so that's been a benefit to us. Because I think we're, we've been able to be a bit more proactive um, in preparing for uh, the fall semester. Hey Steve, we just asked your question. I didn't realize it was yours, so I was about ready to email you all the responses. So I'm sorry, but if you want to introduce yourself, and I think Amy has joined us and Elizabeth has joined us. If you guys want to introduce yourself, where you're from, and your pronouns. Hi, sure. Um, I think I, I know some some of you already I'm, um, from these meetings prior, but um, my name is Stephen Corres. I'm the director of residence life at St. Peter's University here in Jersey City, New Jersey. We're just right across the river from Manhattan. Um, but what, what uh, pronouns he, him, his. Um, yeah, nice to see everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Rochelle, Assistant Director of Campus Living at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Pronouns she, her, hers. Uh, I think that was all you asked. <laughs> and it's good to see everybody. And then Amy. Has everyone else gone? Hi, I'm Amy Lechko. I work at Ursuline College which is in the greater Cleveland area. Um, and I support Residence Life. I'm an associate dean there. And um, I haven't been on these in a moment. So I apologize, my camera was off. I'm eating lunch at the same time, but um, nice to see everybody. Totally fine. You can definitely take your camera off and eat, do whatever you need to do. We know this is during lunchtime. 
Um, Stephen, um, summary was that it's like at more spilled auxiliary group. Um, Lewis was ex Luis was explaining how that they use the time to update and do work in the buildings. And Amy explained that there used to be someone that did it, but with a changeover and stuff. Right now, they're just having the same camps at this time. Hopefully, all of us will get rocking and rolling again. But right now, we're still kind of dealing with pre post COVID stuff. Is that a good summary, everybody? Okay, um, so one of the questions is who will be going to ACE? And um, I do have them checking to see when the small college university networking thing is. So who's going to ACE? What is ACE? I'm a cool eye. Oh, okay. I know you are because you're trying to figure out a flight. Um, oh, you're not? No, I, I don't think I'm going to, well, I can't really fly, um, so um, I don't think I'll be going because there's no way to get there from New York City um, without flying. Right. So who is going and who is in Portland this year? It's at the end of the month. I'm heading out. I'll be there as of uh, next Sunday, or that's Sunday, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after, yeah. The 25th. Okay, well, there is a small college university networking event. So anybody that would like to attend that, it will be on the schedule. So please feel free to stop by. Okay, sounds good. Um, what does RA compensation look like? So I can start with uh, SUNY Marsville. Um, they get their single room rate as a scholarship from financial aid is what it's called. Um, and then they get a $200 meal stipend um, per semester. And then we give them full-size bedding because the RA rooms have full-size beds in them. And due to our um, student population, not all of them would be able to afford full-size bedding. So that is the other compensation we give them. They asked four years ago to get two beds in their rooms so that they can make like, you know, the big, queen slash king size bed. And now all the rooms could do that. So it was the compromise that we would buy full size beds for only the RA rooms. And then a couple of the RDs brought up concerned about financial buying the bedding. So that's why we did that. So they get one set of bedding each year. So if they're returning RA, they get another set in the fall. So that's our compensation. Whoever would like to go next, feel free. Elizabeth, would it be, it'd also be helpful to know like if folks are budgeted for those things? So like, are you budgeted to provide the, the room? Yeah, we budget to provide all of that. So we budget out the scholarship, which is a single room each semester. And it's out of our budget. It's out of the housing room rate budget. And then out of my actual working budget, we budget the meals, which is the $200 a semester. And we budget the money. Could you also share how many um, RAs you have? 52. And two are HRAs. So they're head resident assistants and they have teeny weeny like one studio apartments they live in instead of a room. And they don't get full size bedding, they get queen size bedding. Again, all of it comes out of our budget. It's not just a wash or a pass. We have to literally budget for everything. So when the housing rates go up, I have to change my budget. And when the cost of bedding goes up, I have to change my budget. So. I can go next. I have um, 21 RAs and two undergraduate residence directors. The RDs live in apartments. They have full-size beds. They provide their own sheets. But our, our, our RAs <laughs> um, get room, the same thing, uh, scholarship through financial aid and then free meal plan. And they can choose, we have three levels of meal plans and they can choose any of the levels that they would like. And that's all budgeted too. I actually take a, a little bit of a hit on our meal plans because of the RAs coming out of that. Debbie, did you say you're um, kind of Paul directors or undergraduates? Yeah, I have two and I'm kind of excited. Well, I'm not kind of excited. I'm very excited because we're interviewing for our first full-time RD. We have somebody coming to campus um, in two weeks. 
So it'll be our first full-time RD. This is the, I've worked at seven colleges across the country. This is the only one that I've worked at that had undergraduate RDs. I've been here 13 years and it works. Um, but it's with all the mental health stuff and everything else that's going on, it's time to get a full-time and then we'll eventually get probably two or three full-time. How many students live on your campus? 450. Oh, wow. No, I, I'm asking because we've never had a full-time RD or area coordinator and, and it's very painful. <laughs> I've very, been, yeah, very I've been painful. Pretty, yeah, I've been pretty lucky with really good um, student leaders who do a really good job. And I don't know if it's um, like their training or their mm -hmm. person in gen, like them in general. Um, so we've been really lucky with who we hire as undergraduate RDs. That's wonderful. Is there anybody else on the call who doesn't have an RD or an area coordinator or hall director type? None. Okay. What What is your, I, I'm just, I'm sorry. I don't mean to, is it okay that I'm asking this? Oh, I'm no, okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, I'm just curious what your model is just because we're put, you know, it's been years and we're continuing to push so hard because of what you said, you know, the, the increase in mental health and just a variety of issues that, that need that professional um, live in person. Yeah, um, so um, here at McNeese, um, our situation is very interesting. Um, and it's interesting for me because I'm also new to the role. I only arrived last August. Okay. So basically, um, prior to me getting here, um, housing and res life was pretty much outsourced. So you see how on campuses you have like dining being outsourced to Aramark or so et yeah. cetera. The campus that outsourced its um, housing res life program. And so basically what happened was is that last year, um, they decided not to renew the contract. And so they decided to hire me as a director of res life to come in to do um, on, the, on the res life things or the traditional res life things. You know, okay. comes to the vision of the REs, senior REs, and et cetera. Okay. Um, you know, we, it was part of the plan like, you know, to have um, GAs, et cetera. Um, but looking at like um, compensation as well as like, you know, G is just not being available after hours, like, you know, that hiring just didn't happen. Um, but my hope is that in the future, um, we uh, will hire more full-time staff, but this year, um, being it's like a, a rebuff year, it just didn't happen. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and I think on the point of um, the compensation, um, here at McNeese, um, for context, we have 14 RAs, and so um, during the year, they get a basic meal plan and they get a private. And by saying private, um, I need to clarify because I've worked at schools where, you know, private is, you know, no roommate, you have a single room on the floor. Here, um, it really depends on the hall. So mm -hmm. in one hall where that's really the case, other halls, you simply have a private room, but you have roommates because, you know, you're in an apartment situation or you're yeah. in a suite. So we have that, um, and then um, so the private room and the basic meal plan, but we also have four senior RAs, and the four senior RAs, they get that, and they get a $500 scholarship per semester. Okay. Now, um, for this summer, now that's just the academic year, this summer, um, I was able to push um, through to my, uh, my dean of students, who's my supervisor, um, to really have our RAs be paid. And so right now we only have four summer RAs working and they're working at a uh, for free room, free free private room, free board. And I want to say it's um I can't remember, is it eight dollars an hour for 20 hours a week? So at least you're getting cash. So at least that's good for the at least that's good for the summer. Um, I would like to see that happen during the academic year, um, but because like our hiring budget is small. I don't see us being able to pay cash, if that makes sense. My sense is that we'll probably just keep the model of free room and board and the scholarship for the for the mm -hmm. SPs, but we'll see. Okay, thank you. Um, at Kiyuka, we have a little less than 700 in the residence halls. Um, we have 20, three um RAs. I say that because I we have 23, but I think I have like less than that hired right now. Okay. For, the, for whatever reason I'm we're struggling, but I think what the I think what the reason is we just started a peer mentor program where those students are paid. Um, they don't get the room, but they get 
they get a stipend. And I think right. students are leaning towards that. We are looking at revising it for a couple of reasons. One, financially <laughs> next year that we might blend in some stuff. We're waiting for our data, our assessment data to come in. But currently with our RAs, it's basically a $10,000 package where they get $2,000 stipend. That has to come out of my budget. And then they get um, room credit, um, which is, you know, basically a double as a single. We do have apartments where this RAs for two of the RAs. Um, and for there, they get, um, they can, they can get a meal plan, but they have to get it where it'll impact how. So, so the room is more expensive. Like they, if they change their meal plan from the standard because they can be exempted out of their meal plan, then the for equity reasons we adjust we adjust their stipend a little bit um, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, so they also get the the that kind of adjustment. And you don't have a hall director or a GA. Yeah, we actually have. Well, we have two RD hall director positions okay. and a GA um, position. We um, are currently, we've been asked to put on hold our one G or one RD position because our one person left. So um, we need to find out from a budgetary standpoint what we're going to do if we are going to get that filled or do some creativity with our leadership and engagement position that that person also just, just left had a phenomenal um, opportunity. So we'll see. I guess I can go next. Um, so at St. Peter's University, we have um, about 30 RAs. It fluctuates um, between 27 and 30, depending on how many residents we have that year. Um, but we have about 30 RAs. They do get um, full meal plan and room and board, uh, their housing covered. Um, we do budget for that. It comes out of our budget. Um, we additionally do have two GAs as well who kind of manage um, um, the RAs for the most part or assist the full-time community directors in managing the RAs and the operations in the halls. Um, and our overall um, kind of structure is uh, myself, um, an administrative assistant, plus our assistant director, and then our two community directors, the GA, the two GAs and the 30 or so RAs. I've made a comment in the chat. If anybody would like that information, you can feel free to snag it and take it. Um, right. I was just going to add that, um, and again, Vassar for a long time has been a, a bit of a wonky institution. And so what the equivalent of what would be an RA on our campus, they're called student fellows here. And student fellows don't have like a floor responsibility. They have a responsibility for a smaller group of first year students on a floor. So there could be several student fellows. I would say the, the position when it first started in the 70s, um, back then was provided a $250 stipend. And $250 when the room and board was maybe say a couple thousand dollars was a you know decent percentage of room of the room cost. Um, the issue was that that stipend stayed the same. <laughs> probably till about 2016 or somewhere in that range. Um, I think we upped it to like $500 for like a year. And then our president came in coming from a Yale model. Um, and somehow, and, I, and I'll say this for any of our student leader, selected student leader positions from our student fellows, which again are responsible for first year students. We now have community fellows, which function as a bit more of a, a floor leader. Um, we also have a house student advisor, which is the person who, uh, a junior that typically supports the student fellows. And then we have a house advisor who's a full-time professional staff. We have six of those. But the community fellow position, the student um, fellow position, and the house student advisor position, somehow, and I don't know if folks would want to take a look at this at their schools, um, they're all work-study position. So that is their compensation. Um, it amounts to about $3,000 uh, for the year. Um, no room, no board. Um, I imagine maybe those conversations are coming, but uh, I think because of the history of the way that the program is set up, it, it also means that students can't have another job on campus. Um, but um, it means that I don't have to budget for compensation in the same way. Um, 
that I previously had to, and he, he, you know, the compensation was nominal. Um, and, and for a long time, it was seen as almost like a volunteer position. It no longer is seen that way. It is seen as a, as a campus job, um, but it's a different compensation model than I think other schools have utilized. I'm not sure if it's better or worse, but it's just what we have here. So what happens if a student doesn't have work study? That then comes out of our budget. Oh. Uh, uh, no, actually it doesn't. Um, work study students um, after a certain period, if you don't, you, you don't, um, yeah, actually that's, sorry. That does come out of our budget for students who don't qualify for work study. I guess I can jump in, sorry. Like I said in the chat, somebody walked in my office. Um, so here at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, um, UA Little Rock, we have about 29 RAs, kind of just depend on our need as far as buildings. We are going pre-COVID um, this upcoming academic year. So we will have 29, fingers crossed, I may have to increase. We also have three graduate hall directors, um, a full-time area coordinator, a full-time assistant director, and a full-time director. We're actually hiring for our director position. I was just promoted to our assistant director, and I'm also still sitting in as our area coordinator. Um, our resident assistants are paid through stipend. Um, our, <clears throat> our new RAs are paid $6,500. Our returners are paid $6,950. Um, it is paid out to them through a P AP, so they receive it in regular payments. Um, and that is for the cost of their room. They are charged the um, lesser amount of the room. So for instance, um, last year, the cost of our lesser residence hall was 1,990. So that's how much all of our RAs were charged. Um, and then it's their responsibility to pay for their um, housing out of the stipend that they are given. Um, we do not cover meal plan. Um, and then we also give a training stipend. Previously, the stipend was $125 because we didn't do so many days, um, but I have increased that stipend to $250 for this year. So in the fall, they'll receive um, $250 for training and then I'll reassess what that um, stipend will be for the spring. Um, but that is our our breakdown um, for our RA staff and compensation. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep up on. I try to keep notes a little bit too, in case like the person that has the question asks me later, so I can let them know kind of what's going on. Um, what issues with student engagement are other institutions facing? Um, we're kind of similar to Amy, I think, with we're not getting as many qualified. Well, she's got a competition with this peer mentor thing. We have a competition with our EOP students. Um, the EOP mentors get paid a different way than the RAs do. And a lot of RAs used to come out of like the high-end EOP students because they are amazing. Um, so we're having a hard time getting quality candidates. Um, so we're restructuring our RA um, program because of that. Um, and also, like, I don't know if this is at every other small college, I just feel like it is since it's now the third time I've dealt with it at a different college. All the student leaders are in everything. So, like, to get them to not be SGO and RA and EOP mentor and whatever, um, you got them in everything. So, like, we joke that three quarters of the SGO board is RAs. It's not a joke. Actually, right this right now sitting, it's 100%. Um, so that's kind of what we have that we deal with. Um, it's not a bad thing. It means we have some really good students that really want to be overly involved. But yeah, that's kind of where we fall. I don't know about other kids. Elizabeth, the, what, the question was around student engagement and things that we're seeing. All right. Yes, sorry. What are you seeing with your student engagement? So one of the things that I'm hoping with a full-time RD is that we haven't really had an RHA or like a any kind of hall, um, like entry level. I'm a freshman and I was active in high school, but now I'm in college and still want to be active. That's what I'm hoping that my full-time RD can kind of start 
um, building so that we can grow our student leader candidate pool for anything on campus, not just um, for RAs. Um, I actually have it built into my job description that an RA cannot be our student government president because I've had one or two of those and they travel a good amount and they're just so busy with other meetings and things like that, that I was like, you just, you can't do both. You gotta choose. So I did that a couple of years ago. That, um, um, I guess, Debbie, that's something that um, I just implemented here as well. I've only been in my role here um, as the director for about um, three months now. And we, that was the first thing I noticed um, was that there was a significant amount of overlap between RAs and SGA and RAs. And for some reason, I didn't understand this at all, but some of the RAs also being OLs. So, um, you know, I, I got a lot of pushback from my staff, um, my full-time staff about this, but I, I made the executive decision that we will no longer have anybody from, or specifically the SGA president and vice president be um, on staff anymore because it was a conflict of interest from what our VP had shared with me in prior years. Um, there was a lot of drama there, and I wanted to make sure that we just nip that in the bud right away for next year. And then um, the OL thing, I didn't understand. I, I got I after digging some more, there were some folks in our student life department um, and in our res life department that just felt the need to. They couldn't say no to people, and they wanted to be able to offer these opportunities to as many students as as as, as can possibly have. And it ends up being the same amount of students, but uh, I kind of pushed back on that as well and saying we can't have our RAs during move-in also be OLs. It just doesn't, I've never heard of that system where there, there's RAs and OLs doing the same job um, for both departments on on an orientation or move-in. Um, so I got some pushback on that, um, but I, I have a very good VP who says, I like where you're going. Let's, let's you know, kill some of these um, old school traditions they've had here for a while um, and bring in some some new um, 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 systems. And um, yeah, there was pushback, but I just, I don't, I, it's, I think it's hard to be, as somebody who was the SGA president and also was an RA, I had to take a step back and not be an RA to be the SGA president. So I just don't know how you can fully commit to both massive roles. You do travel a lot. I know, you know, you do get to go to conferences and additional things that RAs don't necessarily get to go to. And then you're not on your floor as much as well. So yeah, I hear you on that. I think, um, I don't know, this is sort of related to engagement. Um, it's sort of related to what Elizabeth was sharing. Um, I think for us, what Gosh, I've been doing this, working with Res Life for 17 years. Um, so um, the director of Residence Life and myself as the person that also helps support the RAs. I also supervise a few RAs and, and I'm pretty hands-on due to our small size. Um, seeing a drastic change in kind of the attitude about being an RA. So, um, you know, I kind of joke that it's a lifestyle choice. <laughs> I'm old school. Um, but, you know, the past two years has been more of a, okay, so when am I not an RA attitude? You know, kind of more of that. Um, it's interesting. And, and to some degree, I can respect it, like looking at self-care a little bit more. And so looking at like, well, is that really in my contract? And um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's across the board, but I've just seen a real change in kind of the level. Um, it's like really more of a bare minimum attitude as far as what you're going to provide which I don't I don't like the excessive either like I'm not going to class because I'm helping my floor right we don't want that but um yeah there I just I've seen like a swing there's no happy medium so I don't know if anyone else has experienced I kind of felt like that this year too and I had the biggest turnover in RAs this year so I had nine graduate and then I had a few others who um for whatever reason decided they just wanted to be a regular person for their last year which is fine so i have a huge turnover but our halls were the cleanest they've ever been on move out i've been here 13 years i closed one of the buildings um with the ra staff in that building and it's a suite style and there's usually so much crap that's left behind and it was the cleanest i usually take like two and a half hours to go through the building we were done in 45 minutes 
So they did something right in that they built the respect because I think that a lot of that stuff that's left behind is, you know, if they didn't build a good relationship with their RA or with people on their floor and they're just like, ah, whatever, I'll just leave it behind. But um, yeah, I saw that too, a little more hands-off and our students are changing. And I think the pandemic just kind of changed our students, but I, I'm hoping that we are, can swing back into it where people really want to get involved. I think they just weren't involved in stuff in high school because everything shut down. So they're not used to doing the things in high school, like the FFA and the, uh, you know, FBLA and all that kind of stuff they did in high school. So now the, the leaders will reemerge. I wasn't allowed to tell my RAs they could be SGO. I tried. It didn't go over well. Moving on. I think um, one of the things that we tried to address in um, there's a health, college wide health and well being committee um, that was established um, this year and just in thinking through. And so this particular year, there was a focus on um, understanding the kind of the culture of busyness on our on our campus. Our students are just overextended. So there's every now and then you. Um, the, a word like apathy might come across and I've, I was just like look I've been at places where students are apathetic faster students are not um, they're highly engaged maybe a little too engaged and and we continue to feed that we give them every opportunity to be doing something at every moment you know that they're awake um, and so you know actually working on a time not like a well, like a time use survey like we want to understand better how students are like committing time to, for their academics, their social lives, on their health, their well-being, and so we're trying to understand that because we do think some like they're maybe too engaged, um, and we'd like them to like work with them to make choices on how to spend their time here, um, you know, so that they can ma maximize the totality of their education that they're receiving here, both in and out of the classroom. One of the things we've, uh, we we found uh, that really resonates, uh, Luis, with the uh, um, during our interview process as we're working with hiring our our res life staff is to have that conversation on the doing component, um, just that business and really that that conversation of we really want you to be a an HA, we really want you to be on our on our staff, but you need to make some changes in your life to do that. So you can do A or B, but you can't do A and B. Um, so we really want you, but you need to choose at this point if you want to sign the contract and you're ours and this is what it looks like. And if you're not, fantastic. You should be a really great person in student government and we just hate to lose you. But they have to make that choice and they can't do it later. And sometimes it's the first time anyone's ever had that conversation with you, that, that, that it's a forced choice ex exercise. We sometimes do a time management scale with them when they we like one-on-one -on -one when we start seeing someone that's like overly committed and getting like you're here for school so let's look at your school load okay why are you taking 21 credit hours and then let's look at everything else you got you got to say no yes is not the best word in the vocabulary let's work on saying no so we we've done it that way with them because it just works sometimes um so is 12 40 and there's one two three questions that are not kind of related to the other ones. So I'm going to work on those. Um, so it's like creating a housing master plan with a small staff, three total people, zero budget. I would just say good luck because I'm so sorry. I don't know what else. I'm sorry to say that, but like zero budget. What the fudge? Okay, moving on. Oh, hi, Laura. I couldn't hear all of that zero budget for what? So the question is, tips for creating a housing master plan with a small staff, three total people, and zero budget. The zero budget part is what threw me. Yeah, What what is that exactly? I would say no budget. They have no budget and they have to be creative is how I would look at it. I'd work with physical plant.
I think I'm a little lost on. So it's a staff of three, zero budget. What are you creating? Are we just saying like the department as a whole? Are we talking specifically about programs? Like what, it, I, that's what I'm lost on. So that's the reason I'm like, I don't know what to suggest because I don't know what the actual question is. Oh, I, I was a housing master plan. It says creating a housing master plan. So I totally agree with like Deb saying work with the physical plan. Cause like, if you have to update your halls, work with the physical plan. Also, if you want to like refresh paint or anything, see if they have a budget. The other thing I was going to say, if I'm working on a housing master plan, like go to my VP, my dean of students, ask what are the expectations of my department with zero budget? What are your expectations? Do you expect us to help with conduct? Do you expect us to do maintenance repairs? Like where do you expect us to do our programming from? And then mattering expectations given, I would then go like shoulder tap those departments and say, I have this expectation. I need to be creative of how to resolve it. I have no money. Can either you help us financially or resource wise? I would That's actually ask if they're planning to phase out residence life. <laughs> I mean, really. That was also going to be something that I mentioned because also if residence life is existing, students are paying to live on campus, where is that money going? So like what department is getting that money? Like at what point and why does the campus living office or housing not have money? Because if I'm a student and I'm paying to live here, where is my money going to where now housing doesn't have access to that money to make things better for me to live there? I know I just switched from being the administrator to the student, but that's how I'm working through it in my head, sorry. <laughs> I think both those questions are very valid. Like, are you phasing out res life? And where's the money going that the students are paying to live in residence life? I think both those questions might be where you'd want to start. Um, when you have leadership teams of less than five and two to three of them leave, at once, how do you delegate the workload? I think it's um I I think that that merits having a meeting and a conversation about what needs to get done, what time of year it is, depending on as well, and just splitting it up. You know, it means that you know for those of us that are in, in senior roles that we kind of roll up our sleeves and go back to being a little bit of a you know an RD and and kind of you know, bring out those skills again. I've had to do it in the past at my previous institution. Um, I'm, you know, it's just one of those things that ends up happening. If you're in a senior role, you just have to kind of step up. Um, that That is tough, but I think that's been happening more more than we think. I, I, I have a feeling it might happen here soon, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, I'm already preparing for that. Um, you know, the job market is, is it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an employee's job market right now. It's not an employer's. So if folks are not happy with the way things are happening in their department, um, especially if they're in the Gen Z category or younger millennial category, they will hop in a year, they'll hop in six months. Um, and I've kind of learned to also embrace that. That's not the end of the world. It means it's an opportunity if somebody has been there a couple of years and it has, has been difficult. Maybe it's a great opportunity to get some new, fun, positive you know, energy into the department as well. So um, it's a blessing. At the end of the day, I'm always told um, when these things happen and I, I, you start to panic that um, at, somehow the university will live on. Somehow students will reside and live and go to cafeterias and classes and programming. It still happens. If I'm gone tomorrow, it's it's not like the school will shut down. So, um, and it's humbling to remember that. And I think um, that's just one of those things that you have to tell yourself and remind yourself, if it doesn't get done today, it'll get done tomorrow. You know, don't over kill yourself, do yourself in with overwork. Um, I've learned to say, you know what, it's now six o'clock. I've put in an extra hour today. I'm good. You know, it'll get done tomorrow. If, I didn't, if it didn't get done today, it's going to get done tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I, I I understand where those folks are coming from. Whoever asked that question, it's it's tough. We had to do it this year. Um, we had an RD leave 
the first week in August, and then we had another RD leave in February. So right after spring opening, and we had to fill the search twice in the fall. So um, what happened is we sat down as a team. It was two RDs, myself and the assistant director. My assistant director and I both took on halls. I took on two, she took on one. Um, so I had to close polls. I had to oversee staff. I mean, it kind of felt back if I did not live on. So the RDs, the RAs kind of felt back a little bit. Um, we have an auxiliary that has on-call people. So we merged with them so that the RDs were not slammed with on-call because that was one thing I was very worried about was them not having a break. Um, and then we categorized what we needed to do and what we didn't need to do. So this summer is a little bit busier for the AD and I to get some of those projects that we put on the back burner caught up. Um, but we knew we had that time in the summer. Um, and I, I'm not going to be a person that's going to make someone work 10 times harder just because the staff isn't here. That's not fair. Like, that's where you really have to have those conversations with upper levels and then Everybody was extremely supportive. Um, the one thing I always do say though is go in with a plan. Don't go in with a problem. Um, so before I even went to the VP, I was like, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna switch it to this model. We're gonna do this, this, and this. Are you okay with it? What do you wanna change? What do you not like? What do you like? And that gets you more support walking in the door versus walking in being like, oh my God, the world's burning and we have no idea what we're gonna do. Um, I don't like when my staff comes to me that way. Um, so I try not to go to my boss that way. I try to go with like, here's our plan. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to implement it. This is how we're going to make it work. Um, and also watch your staff. Um, I had a couple staff members that I nicely had to say like, hey, you've been working for two weeks straight without a day off. I think you need to like figure out a day off. And then don't make your staff ever feel bad. I don't do this here, but I have this at a past job. Um, it means they can still go to doctor's appointments. I had a boss one time tell me like, well, we're short staff. And I'm like, yeah, and I have to go to the doctors. Like it will be here tomorrow. Um, let them take care of themselves because otherwise they're gonna burn out anyways. And there's no point in that helping you or your department. So I always say like, watch your staff. And as Steve's been saying, what is needed, what is not needed, make it work. Because it is definitely an, like employee employees search right now. Um, there's only two other questions. If everybody's cool with moving on, because we've got 11 minutes. One says mold and building closures. That's all it says. Oh, Debbie can explain. And so the other one says information about religious and identity based housing considerations, especially processes and types of accommodations. So I'll let Debbie go into mold and building closures, and then we'll try to get the other one. So like 20 plus years doing this, this is my first go around with uh, mold. So I guess I'm pretty lucky. I've only had bed bugs twice. So that's pretty lucky too. Um, so when you do you, so we have it in a suite style building. Do you close the whole building or do you just close the suite and remediate? You're nodding your head, just the suite? Just the suite. Okay. So, Same. Um, I had never had mold before I moved to central Pennsylvania and uh, I, I do mold every week um, for some, especially basement spaces. So um, you can remediate specific spaces. Um, you need to look at the two uh, the adjoining properties, um, especially if you have some type of ventilation system that might be connected. Oh. Um, but typically we find it in one specific space. It tends to be very specific to student living habits more mm -hmm. than it does institutional issue. So it's not usually in the walls. Um, but and, just close the suite, move the students, remediate. We can usually remediate within a week, and the students are moving right back in. Do your staff, do your physical plant remediate, or do you hire outside? We hire outside. Certainly. And then, yeah. do you? Um, oh, brother. So moving people. Oh no, that was my question. I forget my question. Do you test? Do you test? Or do you just like visual like, yep, that's mold? Yeah, yeah actually, our, um, our risk assessment, um, so we have a, a risk manager for the campus. He comes in and actually does an environmental evaluation, determine if it actually is mold. Most of the time it's mildew. Um, and then determining what type of mold. We only remediate when it's actually mold. We do do an educational session. Um, he has a wonderful 15 minute program on how to clean, um, which is a shocking process for most of our students who have that situation. So he goes through, he finds all the issues in their room. He, removes the wet towels from the radiator from the from their air conditioning unit things like that 
Um, and then he actually provides them with a spray bottle and rags um, to be able to clean their own spaces. Um, if it's not something more than that. If it actually has extended, then we move the students, put them in a crash room, remediate the room, and we let them know they're going to be moving back to that space. So it's not an option to not move back. They're gonna move right back in. Okay, I just, my testing it was the big thing. And then, because one of my VPs wants to close the whole building and I'm like, I can't close the whole building and it's going on right now, but okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, get your environmentalist involved. That's what we do. And then they work uh -huh. with the um, then hire somebody um, or ask the physical plant if they have anybody that's trained. Um, so it's a tag team effort at our school. And um, many times, it, 90 some percent of the time, it's a student environment, like they've created it. Um, it's never past that. So um, one of our physical plant guys, he has a little video and he teaches them how to clean. So I think that's very entertaining um, because a lot of times it is just like, mildew. Um, but again, it's just making sure like work with your physical plant, maybe develop a process now since you don't have one. So that way it's just easy to, this is what you need to do in the future and be done with it. Um, because I would definitely get the physical plant involved and see how they would like to also remediate it a little bit. Um, and then you at least have your process done for the next one. But a lot of times it's, if it's not in the walls and it's just in a room and it's due to environmental living conditions, you can just close that item room. The nice thing about having an environmentalist review the air quality and review the actual process is then you have that backing. Uh, it's really just this one spot. We just have to do this. It will be resolved in this time frame. So that's a nice thing to have. I guess I'm lucky that I have that. Um, but yeah, thank um, you. I told you to knock on wood um, because you were listing a whole bunch of things, and I said go knock on wood because I don't want like everything to blow up. Like you said, you've only had bed bugs twice and all this other stuff. Knock on wood, um, <laughs> please. <laughs> and then the last thing is this: um, we've got six minutes. Um, information about religious and identity-based housing considerations, especially processes and types of accommodations. So identity-based housing, we actually have a spot on the housing application. It has questions. It has preferred name, preferred pronouns, preferred identity. Um, we've been able to open it up a lot lately with our questions. Um, if they have religious accommodations, there is a comment section where they can tell uh, residents like anything else that they need. We have had some religious accommodations because of um, needing us to at least tell them which way the sun rises and sunsets in their room. So we work with physical plant to do that. Um, we've had some food with religious accommodations and we work those out with working with our cafeteria people and everything. Um, and if they need any accommodation that means like a different kind of room, like a sink or anything like that, we do have them work with accessibility services. Our accessibility service lady is amazing. And she actually has something that is for religious accommodations, like if they need a sink or something. If it's medical, then they go through accessibility. But if it's a religious thing, she has a couple questions she asks, and then she asks, like, what is needed? And then she will send me an email, and all she, she doesn't tell me it's religious. She uses the same form she uses for everything, and because she wants to protect the student and their rights and everything. And it just says student A needs blah, blah, blah setting please see if accommodation is available. And it knocks it down. Hi, Jess, welcome back. A little late to the show, ma'am. Um, yeah, I realized I put it on my calendar as central time, not the Eastern time. And I was like, oh no. So. And really quick, introduce yourself and then anybody can answer the question I just answered. And then we're kicking off this thing. <laughs> I just love you. Jess Schweitzer, I'm the Director of Residence Life and Housing at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. Anybody else have a way to answer information about religious identity-based housing considerations, especially processes and types of accommodations? We have a very simple question that just, it's, um, do you intend to use the room for prayer meditation or something along those lines? Um, and if a student responds yes, then our director for housing will reach out to that student to better understand the need um, and, and what it is that they're looking for. Um, and yeah, th that's new this year. 
Um, the, the only other question that was similar to that was a statement to say, particularly for, and just again, for context, um, all our spaces here on residential spaces are all gender. For first year students, they're assigned by gender, but they can advise us if that does not meet their need. And then again, that, that responding yes to that question means a phone call and then um, a, a better understanding of what that student is looking for in terms of a roommate. But those are the only two. Um, and I will say one of the things that we are, we don't allow students to do in their first year is to allow them to, to say, hey, I know someone I want to live with. We're reconsidering that because we're understanding the kind of differential effect that that has on marginalized and vulnerable populations. So students of color who identify another student of color that they want to live with or any student that they want to live with because they just understand that they'd be more comfortable, don't have that opportunity. So that's something we're reconsidering, but um, not for this year. We've always let them pick if they get it in by a certain time, as long as they both put each other down. Like, I can't say, I want Deb, but Deb wants Stephen as a roommate, and then Stephen wants Deb as a roommate. I'm out. Um, so we do have them confirm roommate requests. Um, I am happy that we have those questions on our application because we do have some gender-inclusive buildings and gender-inclusive bathrooms. So um, it has helped with retaining students that might not feel comfortable everybody knowing their business. So I have really appreciated having that. And also it's been able to show them that like we respect their comments and it is confidential. Um, a lot of times they won't put down stuff at the beginning anyways. They weren't putting down anything because they thought like everybody is going to know what's going on. Nope. Nope. I won't even say anything to you. I might shoot you an email saying, hey, do you got time to talk so I can make sure like I understand all the comments you wrote. But that's just so we put you in the buyer living environment that we can put you in and put you with anything. So, okay, it's 12.58. So I will see some of you at ACE, okay. the Kuai Expedition thing in Portland. I call it ACE, sorry, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. There is a small college um, networking on Wednesday night from 4.45 to 6.15 if you're there. We'd love to see you. Um, there's also an SHO pre-conference. If anybody would like to attend that, we would love to see you. No matter what, we would just love to see you there. If you cannot make it, that's totally fine. Um, I'm surprised I'm going all the way to Oregon. I normally cut off the West Coast. No offense to people living in the West Coast. Um, it's just a lot of flying. Like I'm gonna spend a whole day in a plane. Um, but the um, we will have our next one in August, I think we're skipping the month of July. Mm -hmm. You'll get an email from me. But otherwise, we do have the monthly meetings and we look forward to seeing everybody on there. And remember, there is the question answer thing in the QI page. If you have questions throughout the summer, please shoot them in there. Have an amazing summer. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.